Well, good morning. Uh, welcome everyone to this morning study. Um, we're going to uh, be looking, hopefully finishing Judges chapter five. I thought we would do that yesterday, but I think we just have a couple of, of loose threads to look at, but you never know what can jump out at us. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this morning, uh, for the work that you've given us to do, the physical work, um, for the work in your, your vineyard. And we are thankful, Lord, for the people around us that you've placed in our path. And um, we, Lord, invite your Holy Spirit to connect us uh, to one another and to you. And uh, we pray that as we open your word together, that the things that we see will show us our need and give us the confidence and strength in you, that we can live our lives to glorify you. We pray for each person who's participating in these studies, and we ask, Lord, uh, that your Holy Spirit can do a work upon us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning again, everyone. Uh, just a little bit of interesting news before we get into the study. Um, lady contacted me on Facebook. Her name's uh, Bobby Joe. So uh, nice lady. She lives in, in uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas. And she told me that she's going to the Lambert uh, Fellowship, Community Fellowship Church there in, um, what's the name of the place? I can't think. But where it used to be. It's, uh, Bismarck. Yeah. Bismarck, yeah, Bismarck there. So, so I guess the group of Adventists who have been in this movement that were left, you know, not part of Parminder's group, but uh, like people like Tanya and Karen and Paul, uh, they have the church operating there in Lambert. Same old building, though it's been renovated. So, so that was pretty interesting. And uh, yeah, she she saw me on Facebook at the twenty five twenty study group. So she she wanted to know um, some things, and, and she you know needs prayer because she knows she has to make a stand for what she believes. She's been going to some of the churches around there, and people. Are not happy with her believing the 2520. So we need to pray for the church there, the people there. And uh, but I, I thought that was rather interesting. So um, anyway, as we go to Judges chapter five, um, we have just a little bit of loose threads to tie up with this needlework. And um, and then we got verse 31 to finish. Hello, Samuel. Welcome to the study. And uh, so in verse 31, we, we had, we, we spent a bit of time on this. Now, one of the things that we had talked about in was the 6677 number for the word next, which I believe ties us to uh, the study that Stephen did with the 666 years and the 777 years with the 140 at one end, uh, 251 at the other, which adds up to 391, and then uh, the 526 years in the middle. So, and, and this is then this empowerment of, of um, the second angel's message that's being described here. And um, Stephen, did you watch the study from yesterday? Because you weren't there yesterday, were you? No, I haven't. Uh, I think I just started it within the current. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, so there was some things here. I'm trying to remember. Uh, 
slips my mind at the moment. So anyway, what we did is we tied this verse because of the spoil and uh, because of uh, the, well, we got the spoil and the prey, which is the same, same word, 7998 in Hebrew. Um, and then, uh, and then the word uh, sped, right? So um, the word, let me see here. Because um, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, that's Isaiah chapter 8. And that's where the necks came into play too. So uh, that word neck is the same word in Isaiah 8.8. 8. So in trying to put this together, so we're trying to put this together, how this relates. Now we have the 8.8, 8, Isaiah 8.8. 8. And the significance of Isaiah 8.8 8 is this is the prophecy dealing with uh, Marhashala Hashbaz. Now, remember, they're going to write it on a roll, a great roll, which is a mirror, right? So they're going to write this message on this mirror concerning Marhashala Hashbaz. Um, and... Uh, just going to look this up. So it's going to give us here all the different uh, words that that his name is made up of. So Malher, Malher Shalal Hash Baz, swift to the booty, speedy to the prey. So this is going to be from a Maher, which properly hurry, uh, to hurry. Uh, then you're going to see, of course, shalal, the, the one that means booty or prey. And you got 2363, that's kush, uh, um, is, is a maher shalal hash. Here it's hash, but here it's uh, kush. And then uh, the word baz, which means plunder, booty, or prey. So, <clears throat> um, so what you have literally is hurry uh, to the prey. Uh, hurry to the prey, right? So his name is two different ways of saying the same thing, right? That makes sense? So it's a doubling. Swift swift is booty, speedy to the prey, or swift to the, uh, to the booty, speedy to the prey. There's different ways in which people uh, use this. So the symbolic name given by Isaiah, by the Lord's direction to Isaiah's son, Prophetic indication that Damascus and Samaria were soon to be plundered by the king of Assyria. So what do we make of this sort of odd doubling? Why is it telling us the same thing in two different ways in this person's name? How does that relate then? Because oh, what we have to look at is we know about the waters. Um, it says in Isaiah 8, 7, um, now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, the king of, As of Assyria, and all his glory. He shall come up over all its channels and go over all its banks, and he shall pass through Judah, and he shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Right? So we know we have this prophecy. And this, of course, connects to the 2520, because this is a prophecy talking about when the land shall be forsaken of both her kings within 65 years. But it's saying that at the beginning, we're going to have this occur, um, that Assyria is going to, to conquer you, conquer northern Israel, uh, conquer them. And... Uh, <laughs> So how does this fit into, I know I'm trying to bring all these threads together, and it's, it's kind of difficult to sort of keep them all in our minds. But if we look at this verse, verse 30 of chapter 5, have they not sped? Uh, now, this is the word matzah, but it's it actually means have they not come forth? Have they not divided shalak to be smooth, right? Um the prey, the booty, and every man, the comfort of his damsels, to Sisera, 
a prey of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors of needlework, of diverse color, colors of needlework on both sides. Meat for the necks of them that take the spoil. So how do we bring this together? I know we, we, we started working on it yesterday. I don't think we came to a real solid conclusion. We're saying that this is the camp meeting uh, coming up this summer. That's where we placed it on the lines. So any thoughts on this? How do, how do we place this here as July 24th, 2023? What are the symbols there? How do, we, how do we understand this line? Remember, this is the mother of, of Sisera. That is, this is this papal spirit that has sought to conquer this movement that has continued in this movement since December 25th, 2021. The first part of this first angel's message. What is the darkness in this one? What's, what's the darkness in this line? The fact that so many had chosen to set aside July 18th. Okay. Um, well, so we know that this darkness occurs during that 777 days, right? Right. So it's, it's covering that history from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. And we know that it would be this papal spirit, this because what we have is this conflict between Colin and I, that is this arrival of this first message. And and then we're going to see its formalization is another conflict, right? The 391 words in five paragraphs. And then we have November 24th, that's Sisera bowing down to JL. Right with the death of Cicero, of course, uh, there, symbolically representing the death of that message. So this is the message we said that had to do with the Trump prediction, but specifically there were th things in place in our understanding that, had, that were remnants of these ideas of Parminder. And those, when Colin does his presentation, he has this, this very insightful recognition of connecting these different verses in Daniel. So Daniel chapter three, Daniel uh, chapter 11, verse one to four and Revelation 17. But even though he has this, this insight, we're infected with Parminder's understanding. And one is how we deal with each other. So it's not, it's not just like a, an understanding of how to study the Bible in the sense of the intellectual approach, but how to approach the study of God's word together. So, so we can see how that first message then is formalized and then empowered at these, these events. And then we see that the second message is connected to this invitation to study together. That is, if you are benefited by the first, you can then be benefited by the second. So there is a close of probation as such on December 24th, 2022. 
similar to what you would have with the Protestants in Millerite history. Second angel arrives. Some people have not accepted the first message. They can't be benefited by the second. So now in the second message, we have this invitation. Now this invitation, one of the things that we had studied in that, in that period from December 25th, 2001 to December 24th, 2020, is the need for us to come to the upper room, that there is a work that needs to be done upon our own hearts, that the focus should not be upon what needs to be done in other people's hearts, because we are unfit. And so this invitation initially to study the, the line simply presented, and then the camp meeting invitation should obviously be empowered by this camp meeting. But now when we look at that and we look at the verse that we place there, so, so we end up with 525 being the first angel arrives, 526 being the formalization, 527 being the empowerment, 528 being the arrival of the second, 529 the formalization, 530 ends up being this empowerment of the second angel. And, and we would put then 531, as we will see, is this date. Um, but what do we take from that verse that places this at the camp meeting with the symbols that are there? So what, what are the symbols? Is anybody there? Yes, I'm just trying to think through this. Okay. Trying to recall what we were talking about yesterday. Mm-hmm. It's a lot to think about, to keep in the mind. The, the point that we were looking at... Mm -hmm. When we're dealing with this in this stanza about the mother of Sisera, that her wise ladies answered her. Now, the wise ladies for that for that point, would those not be churches that are not following Miller's rules? No, we're saying that the wise ladies are the correct. Those are the wise. All right. Foolish. So we have the wise ladies there that are answering to the mother of Sisera. And well, we're, go ahead. Yeah, and that word answer means they're paying attention. All right. Right. So, so we have in this movement, we have this mother of sister, Sisera who's symbolically being, um, I'm just trying to get to that. So we can all look at it. Um, so we have the mother of Sisera. Now, this is a symbol, right? We don't think that this actually happens, but it's being depicted. So we have this symbolic idea of the mother of Sisera looking out at a window and crying through the lattice, right? Through these interstices. And, and the question we had about why is his chariot so long in coming? Um, um, why tarry the wheels of the chariots? We could see that this applies to uh, the second angel arriving. Right? This is the tarrying time. Now, in this, we can see that there is this. Because um, what we have is this, this mother of Sisera representing what Sisera's goals were. Right? His goals the message of Cicero was meant to conquer this movement. 
Agreed. Right. Now, when she asked this question, and it says the wise ladies took heed of her, right? So that's they're observing her. The word there answered, ana, means properly to eye or generally to heed, that is, pay attention. So there are there's a group of wise ladies, and and this is this mistress. So this is just referring to um, a church, right? There, there is a church, and we could say it's the wise virgins, right? That are paying attention. But she's going to answer herself. She returns answer to herself. She doesn't look for the answer from these wise ladies. Okay, so we're saying that that's the formalization of the message. So are we saying that since she's returning answer to herself, that she is ignoring what the wise ladies are saying to her? Well, the wise ladies aren't actually saying anything to her specifically, but they're paying attention. But she's just answering herself. She has no right. interest in hearing what the wise ladies have to say. But in this, in this case, then, as she is answering herself, yeah. she is, again, she's not looking to follow Miller's rules because she's using her own wisdom rather than the wisdom that's given from God. Right. Now we're saying that um, that this, the wise ladies paying attention, is related to uh, the invitation to the Canadian group, specifically, you know, April 8th. So we're, we put this on this line, we say, well, that's going to be um, the camp meeting invitation. That is, the way that we look at this is that we have been examining all of this history. And what we don't see in this movement in general is people examining first the foundation. Was it laid correctly? That's what this movement did. That's what this study group has done. We looked at the foundation. And then we examined the lines. And once we started examining the lines, we were sorting out the precious and the vile, right? Correct. We're looking at, at this. We're trying to understand what Parminder's message was. So some people just have this, well, Parminder, his problem was he's liberal. But that's not really what it's all about, right? To understand how we're, we're really like him how did we even get in that place that position in the first place so some people think because we didn't follow parminder we're fine you know we passed that test we have nothing similar with parminder's understanding and yet we're still teaching things that he taught that came from him without examining why those what what was the purpose of him teaching those things and we're acting in the same spirit as Parminder was. So, so we haven't changed in spirit. We're still the same. And one of the points that, especially in the, in the accepting of the same spirit, when we have those that are willing not to study together, they're willing to cast others out, <clears throat> that's in the same, same mold that Parminder was using. Right. So, so that's why I'm saying that in this invitation of the camp meeting invitation, those that had been those that have been paying heed to the mother of Sisera, right? They they've looked at what's happening, they're understanding this situation. They realize we need to make not just the invitation to study the lines, which we did first, but we make an invitation to a camp meeting. Right. So after December 24th, you know, I start looking at the fact we need to come together. That's what we've been shown in the previous year. 
So we need to have a camp meeting. We can do that now. No more pandemic. So we can have a camp meeting. I contact, you know, some people at the Canadian group, ask them when a good time is. I start making some plans and then I make a camp meeting invitation, send it out and, and invite people to the camp meeting. Now we're going to have the camp meeting. That's going to be the empowerment. So we're saying 29 is the invitation, April 8th, uh, 2023, whether that's the correct date, you know, for it or not, but that's what we have. And, and then we say that verse 30, this, this re response to herself. So this has to do with those that basically don't come to the camp meeting, right? So the camp meeting is there. And what it is, is it's a separation of this, the wise and the foolish virgins, right? Isn't that what happens with the second angel's message, the midnight cry message? Isn't it a se separation of the foolish and the wise? Yes. Right. So this is what this is showing, this separation. Now, this, these, um, this prey of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors of needlework, of diverse colors of needlework on both sides. We can see this is a progression. It brings us back to the 2520 to Isaiah chapter 8 which also we used as an illustration, the battle between the, king, the North and the South, the King of the North and the King of the South. We also um, tied it in with uh, the verses in Daniel that talked about, about the overflowing, right? So the, the Sunday law. And, and so here we're saying that there's this, this reference, there is this belief within our movement that certain things are going to happen and they don't understand why those things aren't being fulfilled, right? That's what they're focused upon. But the wise ladies, the wise virgins are recognizing what has to happen. That is, we need to come to the upper room. If this movement is going to move forward, we have to put an end to the spirit of Parminder. The message of Sisera has to be rejected. Now, the message of Sisera has been destroyed already, right? That's what we see in this line. But there are those that are still pining for the message of Sisera, that they haven't recognized what God has taught us. Now, with the camp meeting coming up, we don't really know what God's planning, but it seems to me that um, this does fit into these lines. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a bit more to it that we're going to see as we go through some of these, these other lines, because the cap meeting isn't just on this line. Um, but we can see how these verses fit. Right. And originally, when we looked at this, we could see that most of these verses in chapter five, verse 14 to 18 or, or 14 to 31, 14 to 18. Really, you'd have to say uh, that's going to deal with the period of darkness. And then then from 19 to 525, those are all focusing on the symbols that mark December 25th, 2021. But then we could see from then on, we could take each individual verse and it would be a way mark on this line. Now, when we get to this last one, so let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. Um, it's easy just to skip this over, right? So what is this verse talking about? We know the land had rest 40 years. That refers to... Uh, the period of the manna, the 494 months, right? So, <clears throat> so that's going to go to, to, to 2030. So we've looked at that before. But what about this part of the verse? So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. So what is this verse describing?
It's the third angel arriving on the line, April 5th, 2030, we have marked there. All right. So what is that? Okay, so the 40 years of peace in Judges 531. Angela is saying here, uh, contrast the 40 years of Philip Philistine oppression in Judges 13, verse 1. Yeah, they, they are related. Um, I understand that. Okay, so the sun, the sun going forth in his might, isn't that giving us more of a an example from Revelation? Okay, well, it could be, but the, just the, on the simple part of this sentence, this is let him that is righteous be righteous still, let him that is filthy be filthy still. Is it not? There again, Revelation. Yeah, so this is... Those that are going to die and those that are going to reveal Christ's character. So this is a symbol of the close of probation. We're not saying that the close of probation happens on April 5th, 2030. Because we don't know when the close of probation is. But in a line, the third angel's arriving is a symbol of the close of probation. So um, now we're just dealing with this 40 years um, because we go from November 9th, 1989. And um, there's different ways that we can count 40 years. We can count like actual months. We could count uh, like 494 prophetic months or 494 uh, lunar months, right? Different things like that. And it's going to bring us to different dates, depending where we start. Um, so uh, let's see here. I can't remember now. So if we come from count from November 9th, 2019, or 1989, pardon me, November 9th, 1989, and we take the 40 years in the wilderness, we know that it's 494 months, right? And 494 months is 14,588 days or 2,084 weeks. That's the period that the manna falls, right? So we're taking the 40 years as the 40 years of the manna. And if you count it, um, if you count from April 5th, 2030, and you count back 494 lunar months, you're going to come to April 26th, uh, um, uh, 1990, right? That's going to be 168 days after November uh, 9th, 1989. So it's going to bring you to April 26th, right? So this, this 168 days, of course, is a symbol. And so we looked at that. Now, if we counted from November 9th, 1989, and we counted 494 prophetic months, it brings us to Pentecost in 2030. So it brings us to uh, the 6th of Savan, which is June 8th, 2030. That's uh, an inclusive count. So that's counting from the end of November 9th, 1989. Um, so So we have we have things that connect us to April 5th, 2030, and we also can connect it to Pentecost in 2030. 
So this 40 years that the land had rest, obviously this is in contrast to the 40 years in the wilderness or the 40 years. Now here, the land having rest 40 years, we could look at the, the, the Babylonian captivity in a sense, the land has rests 40 years, right? Um, but this is, this is a different type of rest. This isn't a, a captivity rest. This isn't the land physically rest, resting in a sabbatical cycle. At least I don't think that's what it means. Uh, they're obviously growing land or growing food on the land. So why would we have this symbol of the 40 years covering from 1989 to 2030? What does that tell us about our movement? So let's look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Um, so when we get to verse 40, and it says, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him. So we know that this is going to be uh, atheism uh, pushing at the king of the north, right? That's, that's the papacy. The pope is taken captive. And then the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. We know that's 1989. The chariots with horsemen with many ships, and he shall enter into the country, shall overflow and pass over. That's the Sunday law, right? So we see this Sunday law symbolism here in 1989. But we know that um, in some ways that the Sunday law really begins at 9-11. So what would be described here is 1989, but it's also describing 9-11. Do we agree with that? I would think that that's possible. So we've come to understand that the Sunday law that Ellen White saw as this next major waymark, that we've been in it since 9-11. That is 9 of 11, 9 11 marks the start of the Sunday law. But because we've zoomed into that way mark, we have this reform line that includes September 11th. Ellen White's line doesn't include that. That is, her line, I mean, obviously, a line includes these way marks, and these way marks include lines, and each way mark on a line has its own line, and you can continue doing that to some point. Uh, probably down to the individual, right? So we all have individual lines. But what, what we know is that um, 1989 as a symbol is the time of the end. But do we understand the time of the end? Because the time of the end starts a way mark. That is, you have a period of darkness, a particular darkness, and then you have a time of the end. And it's usually connected to a time prophecy. Not always, but it's connected to time in some way in most lines. It, definitely in major lines, you're going to have uh, biblical time prophecies that mark um, that time of the end. But we also have this conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. So what is this conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south symbolizing? Why does that show up at the time of the end?
Isn't this reflecting the third angel's message? Uh, the time of the end? What you referred to on the king of the north and the king of the south. Right. So the king of the north and the king of the south at the time of the end is a conflict, right? Now, we, we look at it, we say, well, it's a conflict between the papacy and atheism, right? All right. Okay. So now we're saying, based on, um, well, let's see how we can get there. So if it's a conflict, it's symbolizing some other conflict. That is... What's happening on Earth prophetically is symbolizing something that's going on and has gone on in heaven, right? If we think about, you know, the time of the beginning, you know, darkness covered the face, you know, the, the Earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, right? And then you have the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters and God says, let there be light, right? So we know that that's, that's a symbol of the time of the end, even though it's the time of the beginning. We have darkness, so we have light coming. Now, when light comes from God to address darkness, there is also a conflict that happens on earth in the sense of the spiritual realm of earth. The great controversy is now being worked out because the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message. And it's really an outworking of the great controversy, is it not? That should be. Because reform lines aren't just these neat little lines that we draw. Um, I mean, they are analytical tools, but, but they represent what's actually happening, right? We don't just create a line and say this line looks nice. That line is representing a reform, whether it's on a worldwide level, a national level, an individual level, or a church level. It doesn't matter. There's a reform occurring. There's a period of darkness. Light is coming. And when light comes, that's the great controversy between light and darkness. And love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. We need to be reformed. Light comes, you have this conflict. But it can be wrought out, in a sense, prophetically, through these major conflicts that occur in the world. That is, they, they become typical. And so we know that's what's happening in this earthly realm of, you know, the Pope being taken captive and... and you know, this conflict with atheism. But these are representing, uh, these are external events that represent what's happening prophetically for God's people. So when we look at this movement, so we look at 1989, I mean, 1989 is light coming to Adventism. You know, you have Jeff, but he's not the only one. He's, he's the one who puts together the reform lots. But lots of people are studying at that time. I mean, I'm studying at that time. I recognize Daniel 11, verse 40, as being fulfilled because I was reading Lewis F. Weir. I didn't because Lewis F. Weir doesn't say, well, that's a second time at the end because he's not looking at a repeat of history. But at least you could see, well, now we're in this this part of the verse, we're not just in Daniel 11, verse 40a, we're in Daniel 11, verse 40b. What we didn't recognize and what Jeff did is that that's a time of the end in a repeat of Millerite history. That's the main insight that he had in understanding the lines is this repeat of history. Back at that time, there was, I um, uh, can't think of the guy's name. I think it was Charles Wheeling. Anyway, he was he was using a lot of these same verses that Jeff 
later I found that Jeff was using, dealing with Alan White talking about this history is going to be repeated. But he was taking it as the prophecies are repeated. So he's making a reapplication of prophecies. And that's one thing Jeff's movement hasn't done, is we don't say, well, this prophecy is really fulfilled this way. Right? We take the pioneer understanding how these prophecies were fulfilled as the past, past as the foundation for understanding the present. We don't just reapply, you know, prophecies and say, oh, well, the 1335, it wasn't really fulfilled, you know, in 1843, right? April 18th, 1844, right? The end of the Jewish year, 1843. It's really, we're going to reinterpret it. And, it, and it's going to be a, a period of 1,335 days. We're going to predict some event. And after that event, we know we have, you know, 1290 and then 1335. You understand what I'm saying? We don't do that. So we understand these reform lines um, as representing what's happening. We don't use the reform lines uh, to predict what's going to happen or when it's going to happen. So, so we don't we don't reinterpret these as prophecies. We just say the past is going to be repeated, and it's being repeated in our time in this way that we can analyze it chronologically, right? So we can understand um, where we are in a reform line. So, if we're dealing with this time of the end, and we're dealing with this this Sunday law symbol we can see how this must relate to every line that is every line in a sense has a sunday law connected with it right as a symbol not a literal sunday law so we know that all of these are typifying what's going to happen and within our movement um so when we go back to this line here, I know this is a real roundabout way of looking at things, but you know we're looking at this line here from December 25th, 2021 to April 5th, 2030. But we know that this line is just a repeat of history, that all of the things that this movement is going through, we bring them all back to November 9th, 2019. That's one of the things the 40 years tells us. So when they said the land had rest 40 years, we're not going to count from the end of this and put 40 years into the future. We just take this as a symbol marking the end of the 40 years. Because this line is part of a bigger line. And that line starts on November 9th, 1989. Does that make sense to people? It hit better. Yeah, okay. So so this is the thing that this movement needs to understand that that we haven't understood. We haven't understood how these lines work. Right? We we could see them and we can we could we could say, okay, Jeff created these lines and this is this is a line. But we haven't really understood the mechanisms there, like why the line exists in the first place. Well, it exists because there's darkness. And, but this is a progressive. There's darkness all the way through, even once you get to November 9th, 1989. There's still darkness. But the darkness is being addressed by these reform lines. But ultimately, you know, we can see that if we're going to go back and see where the darkness starts, this starts before the creation of the world. So all of this reform line, right from creation to the second coming, is addressing that darkness, that rebellion that happened in, in heaven. And it's still happening. Even within this movement, we still have that darkness. That darkness, whatever it is in any reform line, is always related to that original darkness. It's a misapprehension of God's character. It's the exaltation of self. Trusting in self instead of trusting in God. And 
if we can't see that we're infected by this, if we believe somehow that we're immune to it because we know things, we're under a delusion. It's easy to see that the world is in bad shape. It's easy to see that the church is in bad shape. It's easy to see that this movement is in bad shape. It's easy to look at those around us and see the problems. It's not so easy for us to recognize the problems that exist in ourselves and to address them because that requires a cross. None of these other recognitions require a cross. There's no cross involved in seeing that the world is evil. There's no cross involved in seeing that the church has fallen, that the Protestant world has fallen, that Adventist church has departed from the teachings of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. There's no cross in that. There's no cross in seeing the sins of your neighbor. There is a cross when you recognize your own sins and that you have to address them and that we face every day so these reform lines we need to we need to recognize what they are that they are reform lines they are meant to reform us from our sin and god is laying this out saying we have this this opportunity to address a darkness within this movement, but within us, us individually. Because if I don't recognize this darkness here and I don't receive the messages that God has given, I'm going to continue in that darkness. Right? I'm, that line isn't going to benefit me. Okay, so does this line seem solid to people at this point? I mean, it doesn't mean that we saw everything in it. I mean, does it seem strange that God is speaking to us directly now? No. <laughs> no. No. I mean, it might seem weird to some people. You know, how could this book of Judges written so long ago speak directly to us now? Because it's God's word, and God's word better be speaking to us now. That it does in this fashion has to do with the fact that we're a part of this movement. And we need to recognize that this is from God. Now, if somebody would argue that this line is false, someone in this movement, the only way they really could do that is to reject the light that we've had in the past. Because if they've looked at how we've dealt with judges and how things fall into place, yeah, the only way that you could you could reject it is to reject what, what we've already known. Even though these lines may seem on the surface this is pretty bizarre that we've, you know, we we set up a, this, this idea of a camp meeting and we find that this is a line in the book of Judges just at the time we're doing this. But that doesn't, that, that makes sense, right? If we understand God's word correctly of how God speaks to us. Okay. So I hope that part was helpful. Now, when we, so we have this 40 years that the land has rest, and then we're going to have seven years of Midianite oppression. Now, this, of course, is one of the main lines that we've understood. It's a reform line that Jeff had drawn out before. Uh, And, and we've gone through this, but this line of Gideon, I mean, I don't, 
I don't know how far we can get here today, but we're going to start looking at this. <clears throat> so when we looked at the line of Gideon, can anybody just kind of give a summary of chapter six and what we did with it? Judges chapter six. What was the whole... The whole story here. It's going to cover what period? Isn't this covering the period from about 1989 to 2012? Yeah, well, it's going to, yeah, it's going to cover all the way to 2023. But yeah, it starts at November 9th, 1989. That's how we addressed it. That is, there's going to be this oppression. That's the darkness. This Midianite oppression is, um, now we remember that the name Midianites deals with uh, strife. Um, how is it? Maybe it uh, means strife. Right, and so that this is going to deal with this conflict. Now we know that it's going to, this is where we start to see that 9-11-1989, or 11-9-1989, 9-11-2001, or and 11-9-2019 all sort of come together. That even though these are separate events, they actually really are describing uh, our line, right? They, they can be interchanged to some degree, depending on how you're zooming into it. But we're going to see that this this strife has to deal with with this within this movement as well. That is this this conflict that has to be addressed. Now we know um, that we had uh, the uh, Barack and Deborah and Barack. They were addressing Parminder, bringing us up to November 9th, uh, two thousand nineteen. And then this one's going to be addressing all of the history of this movement from 1989 um, to 2023. And it's going to, to cover it first. It, well, it's going to do it in three different ways. We have Judges 6, 7, and 8. So we have these three chapters. Each one of these chapters uh, can be represented in a line. Now it's it's and it's not as straightforward as uh, because there's some overlap in how we've understood the lines and we have to kind of sort this out. This is going to take a little bit of time to sort out. Um, we took a lot more time on uh, Devon Brack than I really wanted to because I'm preparing notes for the camp meeting and it's getting closer and closer all the time. I know I work really good with deadlines, getting things done the last minute, but we, we still have to sort out some of these lines more specifically. And so six, seven, and eight, each one of them is a line. And we have this prophet in Judges 6, 8 that ends up being um, this message, right? The Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel and said unto them, thus said the Lord God of Israel, I brought you forth out of, uh, brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you to the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and, and drave them out from before you and gave you their land and said unto you, I'm the Lord your God, fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Right. So we're going to say that this 
is this message that has preceded uh, this message that's being addressed here, because this is focusing upon um, uh, the prediction dealing with July 18, 2020, right? So it becomes the type of the Sunday bomb. So, um, so we get this period of the prophet is November 9th, 1989 to September 11th, 2001. But we're saying that September 11th, 2001 is also November 9th, 2019. And that's, that's the arrival of, of the first angel. So in this line, we, we, we bring together September 11th and November 9th. 2019 as the same way mark, but we also see November 9th, 1989 is the message of Jeff prior to September 11th, but also prior to November 9th, 2019, right? So that's, that's how we see this message of this prophet. So then the call of Gideon is going to come at November 9th, 2019, because this is specifically this, uh, this structure of Gideon is going to address uh, from 11.9 to uh, December 25th, 2021. And we're, we're going to end up with different ways in, in that we do it. We look at 6, 7, and 8 as these separate lines. But then we also have a line of Jerubbaal and a line of Gideon. And, and they cover similar waymarks for the most part, but there are some differences because they have a different darkness that they're addressing. And uh, even though they cover the same period of time. <clears throat> and then we have, um, you, know, you know, after Gideon, we're going to have a Jotham and Abimelech, right? So we're going to have these other lines that are also going to cover a periods of 777 days or seven years in the case of, of Jotham's line. So, so we have all of these lines and we have to sort them out. I don't want to spend as much time on this chapter, these chapters, as we did on the other chapters. Just because, if, well, we, I, I don't really have control over that. But we've gone through these quite a bit especially Gideon, right? Because we went through Gideon when we studied understanding the foundation and, and we've been through Gideon three other times that we've looked at Gideon. So now we're looking at, at the fourth time. <clears throat> so when we get to the call of Gideon, we have all of these symbols. Now, um, we have the angel of the Lord. There came an angel of the Lord and sat down under the oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abizrite, Abiz, 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 Abizrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide from the Midianites. Right. So he's threshing wheat by the winepress. We can see the symbols easily there. This is studying God's word. The wine press is doctrine. Right. The angel of the Lord appears unto him. And then there's Gideon's response. And so I don't know how we're going to approach this, whether we should just read it all again and go through it and just go through the lines like we did. And any ideas on how we should approach addressing these next chapters? Because we've gone through them. I just don't remember how much, I, well, I don't remember how much I remember. <laughs> I don't know how much I remember. And I don't know how much everyone else remembers. Because it was a while ago, right? I mean, we took so long on um, Deborah and Barack. Would it be best if we go back individually over some of those those prior lessons and have that as part of our preparation for tomorrow. Yeah, it would be good to go over if we have notes or if we wanted to go through some of the lessons. I know it's, it's hard because I really should have given more descriptions of the videos. 
you know, what verse, what chapters and verses we're studying every time in the description. You know, and I've meant to go through through them and write the descriptions in, but, you know, the videos keep piling up. And so, you know, I probably should just do it every time when I do them, but usually I'm in a rush. So um, there's no excuse. I don't really have any excuse. Um, not that I can think of. No good ones. I just didn't do it. So... <clears throat> So it makes it hard a bit to go back, uh, but you can click on a video and you can just sort of open it up and then kind of take your mouse and see what we're, we're doing, what verses we're looking at. That's what I do. Um, so, because we need to be able to sum these up in our own words. We need to know what chapter six of Gideon is about. We need to know what chapter seven is, what chapter eight is. But the basic idea here is that there's going to be, um, he is going to be called, and there's going to be this offering that's made, right? So, so we know that that's what, what ends up happening. And there's a lot of symbolism in these offerings. And then he's going to destroy the altar of Baal, right? And, and then he's going to have the sign of the fleece. So there's lots that happens in chapter 6. And, it, and it's not as straightforward that chapter six is just a line because, you know, it goes into chapter seven and chapter seven has to reach back to chapter six for its line. Um, here I can show you the diagrams that we have of these, the line of Gideon, what we originally had drawn out with some of the modifications when we went through it again. But you can see here we got this line of Gideon, chapter 6, it goes all the way up to uh, Judges 7, so January 11th to 12th, 2023. And this seems kind of odd in some ways, you know, that we have this message from November 9th, and it brings us to here. And, and so what we have to do with this line, and we're going to probably put these on individual play, pages, and address each of these lines. Um, and we put these way marks there the last time we looked at it. But then we have Judges 7. So Judges 7 is a zoom into this third angel arriving. But even in doing so, it's going to just repeat a lot of the same symbols. So to have this line understood, we need to know what the period of darkness is, what the messages are, and why we mark these different dates as these way marks. And so when we look at Judges 7, it gave us all these symbols that we could place, and then the same with Judges 8. But this is Judges 8 is going to bring us to July 19, 2020. And, and then you have the Man of Penuel and the Sukkoth, and this is going to be specifically addressing, at least that's how we did it, um, Colin's prediction. Somebody who was saying something there? <clears throat> so when we had done this the last time, we had um, specifically marked out these way marks. So just like what we have done with... Um, the Song of Deborah and Brack, we did that with this already. So the Song of Deborah and Brack, we were, what we're doing right now is we're supposed to be filling in more details and explanations on these charts. So you have these charts. Um, I sent them to everyone. So you could look at them and try to see if you can piece together what, what these lines mean. But here we had this two different ways of looking at the 777 days. That is, with Jeroboam and Gideon, what we have is a different period of darkness, even though they start at the same time. And even though Jeroboam and Gideon are the same person, <laughs> under the name Jeroboam, 
we create one line under the name of Gideon, we create another line. And, and so we need to remember this, why we did this. And both of these lines contain 187 uh, days, right? The, the one of Jeroboam. Now, now, what's the difference between Jeroboam and Gideon? Why do we have the two different names having two different lines? Anybody remember why why we did this? Jeru Bale let De let Bale plead. Yeah. And then with Gideon, we were having to go back through this because we had subtle differences that that needed to be addressed in both lines. Yeah. And, and when you look at the one with Jeru Bale, it's going to deal with the 187 days that go from the publication of the warning to Nashville to um, uh, the bombing of Nashville on December 25th, 2020, right? So it has, it has a message that we would need to understand. We need to understand what the darkness is and why Jeroboam, that this has to do with Baal, right? In the sense of it's addressing an external event, right? With the line of Gideon, it's, it's more, more internal. internal. It's more internal. Even though there are external events that witness to it, Jeroboam is the Nashville prediction, the warning given to Nashville. Gideon is more about what happens within the movement so the 187 days there are going to be the ones that the one that begins with the end of the 100 days of prayer, 13 days before July 18th. It's still going to have the December 25th, 2020 event there. Though in this case, it's a formalization, not an empowerment of the second message. So it has a different role in this line. And then the 13 days from there to the end of this 187 days that starts with the siege of, of Washington. But really, it's actually the 10 days of prayer that are being marked there, January 6th to 16th. And then we have this new message arrive on December 25th, 2021, where um, both of these have that but in this line this internal line it's going to give us that december 25th 2022 date that invitation date and then um where the top line of jeroboam is going to give us the end of colin's prediction date so here we're addressing uh, a number of things uh, one of the ways i looked at this is um which, which almost seems sort of backwards, but, but, you know, they're addressing, we got two different things that are being addressed in this movement. The July 18 date, how do we explain it? And, and Odilia, has, Odilia has a solution that relates to the mandates. So it's the way that he has of trying to retain the significance of July 18 is that it's part of the structure of the mandates. And then we have um, in Collins, his is addressing more um, Trump, right? So what Jeff had said about Trump and trying to retain that understanding. Now, this is a simplification, you know, of describing the purposes of these, but that's what they address. And, and so that somehow relates to both of these lines as well. But really, they're the same line in a sense because Gideon is Jeroboam, and it's and it's the same way mark in uh, the judges line, right? So that it's it's eleven nine in the judges line, right? So it's November 9th, two thousand nineteen, right in the judges line above. <clears throat> um. 
So, so what we need to do is we need to de delve. I mean, I don't think we can avoid digging deeper into the verses to help clarify and correct uh, what we've done with these lines. I, I don't think that we can avoid that because as we've gone through these other lines now, we've looked at some things that we didn't really look at before. One was the Hebrew uh, numbers from Strong's Concordance, and that's given us a bit more information. It helped establish these lines uh, much, much more clearly. So, so we're going to have to approach it in that way again. But, you know, it's, it's, we spent a lot of time on Judges chapter five. I don't want to spend that much time on Judges chapter six, and then that much time on Judges chapter seven, Judges chapter eight, because we'll never get this done. So how could we approach this? Obviously, individually, we need to study it. We, we have all these symbols, you know, July 18, uh, you know, if you look at judges, what we could do is we could read through these verses and try to figure out in our own minds why these dates are marked. Now, we're, we're going to know some of them, November 9th and 1989, September 11th, 2001, November 9th, 2019. We should all know the June 21st and 22nd. That's the publication of the Nashville prediction. June 27th is 126 days from when Jeff first un, uh, presented Rafi and Panean in Alberta. Um, I think that's right. Uh, June 27th, right. And then it's going to be another 273 days to March 27th, 2021. Um but that 21 days there before July 18th, that comes from the story of Daniel. That's the three weeks. So we had applied that at the time on June 27th. But that's not really, a, you know, it's not completed in this line. It's going to deal with uh, the fleece. And the fleece is going to be uh, these two different studies, right? The first one is examining the foundation. And the second one is the study that we're on right now, understanding the lines. So those are going to be the dates that these studies began. And then we say, well, Judges 7 is this third angel arriving. That's January 11th, the 12th, 2023, the end of Colin's prediction. So you can see how this is, how we're going to have to go through this. So should we read the verses and then, because we're not going to do this today, but are we going to just read the verses through or are we going to look at the way marks and then go back to the verses and just try to establish it from the verses, the references that we gave, which, which would be faster, more efficient. What's, what's the fastest way to do it? To just read the scriptures first and then try to create the lines again? Or would it be better to look at each of the lines? Okay, looking at the way Mark uh, Daniel says. And then... It might, be, it might be best if you pick a couple of the videos that we've already gone through. Yeah. So that we could review those before tomorrow morning session. Okay. Um, so when we look at these videos, so this is going to go back a ways. Because um, uh, when did we last look at Gideon? It's going to be a long time ago. Um, 
I'm just seeing where we were back here. Yeah, because you're, you're going to have to go back to the beginning of this year. Um, and I thought it was further back than that. Um, yeah, maybe you could be right. I'm just... No, it's further back than that. You're right. So um, just trying to look at the pictures on the charts on the see where we are yeah so it's probably well okay um yeah this goes way back actually so you have to go back to um study number like you have to go back to November and so that's like November, the middle of November study number 222 might be one where we're addressing what we're addressing now. And symbolically that would be rather interesting. Yeah. So yeah, that's where we're addressing this. That's where we're going to start drawing out uh, the first angel arrives, the second angel. So that's going to be um, starting about there. Okay. Uh, so study number 222. So if we were to take a look at study 222 and potentially 223, we well, should be able to prepare for a lot of this and have this refreshed in our minds for tomorrow. Yeah, um, and maybe even... Uh, so because in study 220, um, no, even study 220, we could look at that one. I think that's really where it starts. Um, so in other words, taking a look at the study that has the symbol of restoration yeah we might still have to go back even a bit earlier but yeah take a look at that just kind of skim through those studies a little bit and see where where we are okay so anyway i appreciate everyone's uh, participation today um so uh, we can close in prayer dear father in heaven thank you for the study for each person May your angels watch over them. May your Holy Spirit speak to each one of us today. Help us to follow and serve you. And help us to understand these things and to prepare these things for the camp meeting. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.